that you are here today. Today, our gospel lesson focuses on peace and how we can have peace with God. Not a peace that is without war, but a peace that knows that we are forgiven. And in our sermon series, the fifth uh, part of it is focusing on our heavenly home. We begin by singing our opening hymn, that's 492. Father has forgiven. 
your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
text for today. It describes the, uh, this the lesson describes the New Jerusalem. The beauty and the magnificence of it are not to be taken literal, and so we don't know exactly if uh, all these things will be there, streets of gold and, and jewels and abundance. But we can know one thing, that Jesus Christ the Lamb has brought us to this magnificent place and promises that it will bring us perfect happiness. We read from Revelation 21. He carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God. Its radiance is similar to a very precious stone, like crystal clear jasper. It has a large high wall. It has twelve gates. Twelve angels are at the gates, and the twelve names are engraved on the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. Three gates are on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The city's wall also has twelve foundations, and on them are the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God has given it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. This is the epistle of our Lord. <coughs> Alleluia, Alleluia, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, Alleluia. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia. <laughs> Because 
of having no sin and having abundant light coming from you. Maybe we want to be in such a place of perfect happiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise for the gospel. Jesus continues to prepare his disciples for his visible departure. He gives a new command to love one another, and that means loving him and his word. Loving Jesus means more than loving uh, his, his teaching. But uh, we don't need to fear at this impossible task. With untroubled hearts, we believe in Jesus. Our text is from John 14, reading verses 23 through 29. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. The word that you are hearing is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have told you these things while staying with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. You heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. This is the Gospel of Earth. You may be seated. We continue by singing the next hymn. Uh, 377 will sing stanzas 1 through 4.
morning who was and who is, who is, who was, and who is coming. Revelation 1 4. Your friends in Christ, when a person studies God's Word, the reader encounters a number of mountaintop experiences. The first mountaintop experience occurs in Genesis when the ark rests on Mount Ararat, which suggests to no one in his family that the impending flood is coming to an end. God tests Abraham on Mount Moriah with the sacrifice of his son. As a leader of God's people, Moses has several mountaintop experiences, from the burning bush on Mount Korah to receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai to uh, viewing the land of Canaan from Mount Nebo. Hundreds of years later, Elijah had a mountaintop experience when the Lord appeared to him on Mount Moriah in a still small voice. Then consider all the mountaintop experiences that Jesus had. His uh, temptation in the wilderness, his glorious uh, transfiguration before three of his closest disciples, and his ultimate mountaintop experience when he died a sacrificial death on Mount Calvary to atone for the world's sins. In the closing chapter of Revelation, we are informed of Scripture's last mountaintop experience. In the final vision, an angel took John to a great and high mountain and showed him an awe-inspiring sign. John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and this city was the final or permanent residence of God's people. It is the eternal home of the church triumphant. During the last four weeks, we have recognized our risen Lord's glory and power. We have seen how, we have heard how we will see a multitude of uh, the heavenly host praising the Lamb. We know that the Lamb will be our shepherd, and we've heard how the risen Lord is making everything new. Today, as we continue our sermon series, recognize our risen Savior in Revelation. We will see how our risen Lord gives us a heavenly home. First, we enter through our home's gates. In John's vision of the New Jerusalem, he saw a large high wall with 12 gates. In ancient times, a great high wall protected the inhabitants of a city. This wall signifies the permanency of heaven. Only God's people safely reach their heavenly home. They are perpetually protected. In heaven they are completely free from any threats from body and soul. No evil force will shatter this paradise as it did, as sin did in the Garden of Eden. Likewise, God's people will never be tempted to leave this city because they will be experiencing eternal joy. Twelve angels are at the gates, and twelve names are written on the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel were God's chosen people in the Old Testament. The number twelve symbolizes the church, the sum total of all of God's people. The fact that the names of the twelve tribes of Israel are written on the gates implies that only God's people can enter the city. Since angels protect God's people, that the gates are guarded by twelve angels indicates protection. Within the city walls, the protective power of God's holy angels will comfort us. Like God's cherubim, who blocked the original paradise, these angels may be guarding the city, the gates of the city, to make sure that only genuine Christians are uh, able to enter paradise. Angels at every gate will also serve as God's official greeters to his heavenly home. The arrangement of the gates in heaven of three on each side of the city wall implies that the city, the city has a uniform, uh, symmetrical construction. After reading verses 15 through 18, one realizes that the city is a perfect cube. Significantly, the most holy place in the tabernacle and the temple were perfect cubes. God is in this city, and further expansion of it is not possible or necessary. All of God's people, like living stones, who form Christ's church, 
will be in the glorious presence of the risen Lord forever. The four sets of gates that God, uh, that John saw in the vision represent the reality that God will permit people to enter his heaven only by his, on his terms. No one can enter heaven by inventing his or her own religion. People only enjoy the glory of heaven by entering through God's designated gate. As Jesus declared, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. Believing Jesus as our risen Lord enables us to enter this gate with joy. There are only a few walls in this world that are genuinely famous. The Great Wall of China is certainly impressive. The Wailing Wall of Jerusalem is noteworthy. The Berlin Wall that divided East and West Berlin symbolized the tension between the United States and what was then uh, the Soviet Union. In November 1989, the Berlin Wall was torn down as a result of increasing de democracy in Eastern Europe. Today, little of that wall and that once terrifying wall remains. And as terrifying as that Berlin Wall was, this symbol of tyranny can't compare with the terror of our sins. Because of Christ's work, we are no longer under the tyranny of the devil. The Apostle Paul wrote to Ephesians that through Christ's work, the dividing wall of hostility that separated God and us has been torn down. Through the cross, both Jews and Gentiles are reconciled to God. Now, both through Jesus, uh, through Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. People have been constructing homes for thousands of years. Home construction has progressed significantly, and yet the basic ideas of human shelter have remained the same, beginning with the need for a firm foundation. Any home that does not have a firm foundation will not stand the test of time, nor be a desirable place to live. So second, we build on our home's foundations. The city wall also has 12 foundations, and on them are the 12 names of the Lamb's 12 apostles. Again, the number 12 signifies the Holy Christian Church. Christ's one true church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. In the New Testament, Jesus told, chose 12 apostles, matching the 12 tribes of Israel, to be his personally uh, taught and sent ambassadors. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write the very words and deeds of Jesus. With the inspired word of God, they proclaimed the saving truth that Jesus is the risen Lord. God's word establishes the foundation of a church that it is so secure that not even the gates of hell will overpower it. The gospel of Jesus saves because it proclaims that the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. His promise of the Savior to his people in the Old Testament was fulfilled when God sent the Lamb, the risen Lord, to die and rise again for people's sin, with sin forgiven by Christ's atoning death. Satan's threat has been silenced, and hell's power has been trounced. For Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The ensuing verses in the state that the wall is made of jasper and the city is pure gold like the glass. This portrays the beauty and the safety that the elect will enjoy in God's presence. The foundations are decorated with every kind of precious stone. We can't uh, classify all these treasured stones with certainty, but the precious jewels, the pearly grates, and the clear gold streets aren't really a true picture of heaven. All these pictures are earthly symbols of what it is like to be in God's eternal presence. Many of people are afraid to die because they don't know what heaven is going to be like. Since many of us don't know what is on the other side, we have doubts about whether we will enjoy it. A sick man turned to his doctor as he was leaving the room after paying his doctor a visit and he said, Doctor, I'm afraid to die. Tell me what lies on the other side. Very quietly, the doctor said, I don't know. 
You don't know the man said? You, a Christian man, do not know what is on the other side? The doctor was hand, uh, had his hand on the doorknob, and on the other side of the door was the sound of scratching and whining. And as he opened the door, a dog came springing into the room and eagerly la and leaped upon him with gladness. Turning to the patient, the doctor said, did you notice my dog? He's never been in this room before. He didn't know what was on the other side. He knew nothing except that his master was here. And when the doctor opened the door, he sprang into the room with gladness. I know a little of what's on the other side, the doctor continued, but I know one thing. I know my master is there, and that is enough. And when he opens the door, I will pass through with no fear, but only with gladness. Third, we worship in our home's beauty. As with other symbolic pictures in Revelation, what John saw and described isn't exactly what heaven will be like. It's a symbolic portrait of the church triumphant, painted by the Holy Spirit to heighten uh, or highlight some vital truths in regard to Christ and His church. In verse 10, therefore, the reference to Spirit may be slightly misleading in that it doesn't have to refer to the Holy Spirit. Most likely it means that John is in a spiritual state in which he could receive some of these, revel uh, these visions. Here John gazes on a grand scene, a scene that is impossible to contain in any ordinary earthly setting. This vision further amplifies the vision of Christ's church. Down out of heaven from God implies that God is giving us a picture of the church's, redeem, uh, the church's glory. And God himself is what makes the church glorious through the redeeming work of the risen Lord. The Jews designated Jerusalem as the holy city because it contained the Lord's holy temple where God and his people joined together in spiritual worship. How fitting then to call this glorified church as the holy city. It indicates that there will be perfect, endless communication between God and his people, people whom he has declared holy through the death and resurrection of Jesus. The glory of God equates or equals the glory of the Lord in the Old Testament, who filled the temp tabernacle in Solomon's temple. It was a radiant light in which God visibly proved that he was present with his people. The Greek word for radiance really means light source, and it isn't listed in any other place in the Bible other than Philippians 2, where it says witnessing Christians are described as shining like stars in the universe. Understanding this word as a light source would also fit the picture of God on his throne as a brilliant, precious uh, uh, stone and uh, the lamb being the church's light the, and the, the lamb being the city's light. The light source is the Lord himself. God fills the new Jerusalem with heavenly light. And John says, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now John has left the outer structure of the city, and he describes the city's inner features. John expected to see a temple in the holy city, for the temple had been the very heart of Jerusalem. It was the center of worship life, and the place where God's grace was dispensed, and where the believer um, approached God with sacrifice and uh, thanksgiving. But then John sees that in the New Jerusalem there is no need for a temple, for they are in the very presence of God himself, and there is direct, personal, intimate, com spiritual communion between God and his people. The church members are in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, the all-powerful yet gracious God, and in the presence of the Lamb who was slain for their sin. In their presence all believers enjoy the endless thrill of eternal worship. In John's vision of the heavenly Jerusalem, there is no created light, no electrical lights of any type existed, not even a single flashlight, nor are there any heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, or stars. There is no need for any created light, for heaven will be illuminated by the glory of God. The glory of God radiates from the Lamb, who is described as an oil-burning light. 
Both light and lamp refer to Christ. This light source is a source of light. As sunlight gives life to the plants, so God gives life to his people. Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, will rise to offer healing to all. Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This light from the glorified Christ makes our home magnificently beautiful and gives us eternal life. A month before his 93rd birthday, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina invited Billy Graham to come and to say a few words before their group. But Billy initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he was suffering and struggling with Parkinson's disease. But the leaders said, we don't expect you to have a major address, just come and let us honor you. And so he agreed. After many compliments, Dr. Graham stepped to the podium and said, I am reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist whom Time magazine honored as the man of the, the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train, and the conductor, as he walked down the aisle, was taking everybody's ticket. When it came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket, and he couldn't find his ticket. He checked his trousers, and he couldn't find his ticket there either. He looked in his briefcase, and he couldn't find it there. He looked in uh, beside him, and he still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I, I know who you are. We all know who you are. It, it's okay. It's no problem. You don't need a ticket. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued to punch tickets. And as he was moving into the next car, he turned around and he saw the great physicist down on his knees looking under his seat for his ticket. I'm sure he bought one. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. We, I know who you are, no problem. You don't need a ticket. And I'm sure that you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am, who I am. I just don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Having said that, Billy Graham continued, see the suit that I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren have told me lately I've been getting a little slovenly in my old age. So I went out and bought a suit for this luncheon and another occasion. What's the other occasion? This is the suit that I will be buried in. But when you hear that I am dead, I don't want you to think about the suit that I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I know where I'm going. My prayer is that each of you would be so confident about your future that you know where you're going. Our risen Lord freely gives us a heavenly home May we enter through those gates, build on his foundations, and worship him in beauty. Amen. May the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we say together the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 41. You know what it's also on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the offer.
Please stand. O risen Savior, grant us hearts to yield you gladly, freely of your own. With the sunshine of your goodness, melt our thankless hearts of stone. Till our cold and selfish natures, warmed by you, at length believe that more happy and more blessed tis to give than to receive. Amen. We join together in saying responsibly the prayer of the church for Easter that's found on page 126 in front of me. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Thanks be to God, you give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Draw Drive out all doubt and gloom, that we may delight in your glorious time. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints, and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people, standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive wisdom and power and honor and glory and grace. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and the new life of, to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Risen Lord, live in us that we may live. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. Dear Almighty God, who in, in whose hands are all things, you control the weather, the storms, and all our lives. We pray today for those affected by the tornado in Gaylord. We know that there is much destruction and a couple of lives were taken. And we also know that it is going to take a lot of help to rebuild that city. We pray uh, for those people that they would not despair, but that they would gather together and uh, help each other. And many do that because of you. We pray that this tragedy would inspire in them an ability to want to help each other because of love for you. Help them not to question your uh, divine providence, but to see that in these tragedies are ways that we can help others. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts we come before you and say, Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, we continue with the next hymn 154.
forget the, uh, there is a chicken barbecue at Clarny Lutheran Camp. There was supposed to be an insert in it. I will put it in next week, but it starts at 12 and it goes till 3. So um, and that information, uh, I'll put it on the whiteboard and I'll have it and make sure it's in the bulletin um, uh, for next Sunday as well. It's next Sunday for 12 and 3. Uh, the Ascension service is this week on Thursday at 7 p.m. We're invited to that. The flowers on the altar are given by Ralph Schumacher and Mary of his wife Donna and uh, Kate's birthday that is tomorrow, right? Uh, so happy birthday to uh, Kate. Um, address change you can get there on the thing. Uh, delegate for the Michigan to the convention. Uh, each congregation is entitled to it, uh, at least one lay delegate. If you'd like to, have, please talk to me today. Uh, I plan to put in the information, uh, the, the registration information tomorrow. Pastor Scott Mosher will be installed as the new pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Lansing today at 4 p.m. Uh, if you want to attend that. Um, and um, the other thing that is not in here is the Reef Miller Memorial Committee. It should have been in here. And that um, we will have a meeting, but it'll be a very brief meeting because we don't really have too much to update on. On it. But uh, after the Sunday social, we'll, we'll meet just briefly and discuss uh, a little bit about uh, the progress of things in the community. Um, so this is Wells Connection Sunday, so um, if you could dim the lights, some of them.